but I'll just introduce myself quickly and then I'll just keep checking if there's anyone else coming on. So thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. Um, so I'm Georgie, um, I'm the 5K Away Operational Manager. Um, Rachel was looking after these workshops um, as the resources officer, um, but she's now left because she's moved to Bristol for a, um, another job. So please um, to introduce you to Chloe. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, as George was saying, I'm I'm taking over the online resources. Um, I'm also the 5K Away Operational Officer, so I'll be supporting all our amazing groups and ambassadors. Um, but yeah, you'll see me in the future at these workshops. So that's great. Thanks, Georgie. No, thanks, Chloe, and welcome. Very excited to have you. So yeah, for anyone that doesn't know, these are our free online workshops, which is kind of one area of work. Um, run by move charity we are ideally shouldn't have our 5k away tops on just to confuse things but um my move one is in the wash so um basically 5k away is one of the areas of work of move charity and then as chloe said the other area that she's going to now start looking after is our online resources which kind of includes these workshops we also have a move against cancer podcast we have a move on um we have a move against cancer youtube channel um so yeah if you don't know anything else about our resources definitely um have a look at them on the website and then kind of the the third area of work is our move online program for young people um so yeah basically we've got 5k away the move online program and then these online resources so hopefully that's a bit more about move charity background for you if you are interested in finding out more then um do have a look on our website and then you'll see a bit more about it so hopefully that all sounds okay um a little bit of kind of housekeeping background please feel free to have your camera on that is great if you do want to see if you know if you want us to see you but if not you don't have to um but don't worry you won't be recorded only um you know the people talking will actually be recorded and um, but please do keep yourself on mute just so that we don't have any background noise if that's okay um and then if you do want to ask a question or comment or say anything please just type it in the chat box and um myself and chloe will kind of um monitor the chat box and and, and watch that um and then if you do so it will be recorded throughout but you won't be able to see any of you you'll only be able to see like i say, the people talking um so myself and then joe and Naaman. But um, if you do want to actually talk at the end, when we kind of get to any questions, we can just, you know, you can just unmute yourself and talk then and we'll just stop the recording. So well, we, it will kind of, um, we'll cut it off when we when we pull it together. So hopefully that makes sense. And um, please just pop any questions that you may have in the chat box or anything like that. Um, and without further ado, I'd love to introduce our fabulous, fabulous uh, guests, Joe and Naaman um, from Rad Chat. And, I'll let them properly introduce themselves, but we're very, very grateful to have them here. And um, over to you both. I will make Joe the host and then I will be quiet. So thank you very much all for joining us this evening. And please do say hi in the chat box and write any questions. Um, hopefully that works, Joe. Yes, and I've got some people in the waiting room, so I'll just let them in. Well, thanks, bro. Hi everyone, sorry if you were Waiting in the waiting room, hopefully um, in now. Yeah, sorry, that was my fault for not checking and reading off my script. But <laughs> welcome everyone, I just quickly said hello. Um, but yeah, over to Joe and Naaman now. So I'm just going to share my screen now that I have all the power. All the power. <laughs> right, I'll put myself on mute, but just um, remember to spotlight yourself as well, Joe, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will do that now. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So welcome everyone. Um my name's Joe McNamara, one half of Rad Chat. Um I can't I can't work out with the mirrored which side of my face you can see. Um both are very similar. They are almost symmetrical. Um, but I am a therapeutic radiographer by background um, and I'm also a senior lecturer at Sheffield Hamley University teaching across health and social care, hence the background. Um, so um, I have been qualified <laughs> far too long now to even tell you, but hopefully that ensures that I've got some uh, clinical expertise and lots of knowledge to be able to help impart and inform you in today's webinar. Um, I am also a former National Macmillan Clinical Fellow, so I helped support the Allied Health Professional team at Macmillan and also 
help to develop resources um, to highlight radiotherapy and the role of therapeutic radiographers. Um, and I also do consultancy for Radiotherapy UK and as part of RadChat we do quite a lot of consultancy for charities um, to try and improve some of the information available to patients um, around radiotherapy, radiation therapies um, and also supporting them with late effects. Um, and I'm a 5k your way ambassador as well, hence the jumper. So I hand over to my other half. Hi everyone, my name is Norman Joe Cranston. Uh, so I'm a Macmillan treatment review radiographer. So clinically, I work supporting patients with any treatment side effects throughout their radiotherapy treatment. Uh, and for two days of the week, I also work for Macmillan Cancer Support as a national uh, allied health professional clinical advisor. Uh, obviously, one half of my face is also on a logo of Joe um, and similar. We actually met through working together for Radiotherapy UK. The similar sort of things. I've dragged her into 5K away now. So we're basically the same people. So obviously you've come today to find out more about um, radiotherapy and radiation therapies. It's just to be aware that you can contact us. We do have social media platforms and also our email contacts. So if you did have any residual questions or want to just find out more, obviously we are governed by time, which is quite short, around 45 minutes. And as a consequence of that, it's just to kind of be aware that we can help and support you even after this webinar, if you need any questions answered. Um, so I think the place to start is the actual oncology pathway. I think one of the first things to bear in mind in everything that we state tonight is that every patient's experience is going to be individual. It's very personalised and we want healthcare to be that way to ensure that patients get what they need and when they need it. Um, but essentially there are kind of pathways that generically patients will go through. Um, so presenting with a GP with signs and symptoms of potentially a malignancy, another word or a cancer or something that potentially is is not quite right that needs investigation um in terms of kind of being diagnosed by a gp um you know they see hundreds and hundreds of patients every single year and actually statistically the average gp will only diagnose a cancer patient eight times um per year so as you can imagine when you present with signs and symptoms it's very easy to automatically think i might have cancer and i need to be referred but actually if they were to refer everyone with any sign or symptom of cancer then actually there wouldn't be the the facilities to be able to support that number of patients and actually a lot of patients would be having diagnostic interventions without needing them um, so they do have to be really careful in their role to be able to kind of select patients who then need further investigation. So typically what will happen is a GP will um, refer their patient for a diagnostic um, intervention. So that again varies depending on their signs and symptoms and where in the body it is, whether or not it's an ultrasound, a CT scan, an MRI scan um, or a review by a specialist. That usually, if they think that it could be cancer, has to be done, hopefully, within two weeks. So you kind of get put on this two-week referral pathway. Once you've had that diagnostic intervention, you'll then be reviewed by the radiology team, which will review those investigations to see whether or not they can find any disease that potentially shouldn't be there. And then from there, you then get referred. Now, for cancer patients, surgery is still the main treatment of choice. So about 70% of cancer patients will have a surgical treatment. Um, and obviously that can vary depending on whether it's a biopsy to look at histopathology or whether it's a full removal of a tumour. Then patients may go on to receive immunotherapy or chemotherapy. And then more traditionally, you'll find that radiotherapy comes at the latter end of a treatment pathway. And radiotherapy is typically referred to as the insurance policy. So radiotherapy can be used to mop up any cells microscopically that potentially may have been left after surgery. Or potentially, if they've had some surgery and the scar is there, they may want to do some radiotherapy specifically to target the scar to ensure that there isn't any cells left 
on the skin surface or within the incision site itself um, to make sure that they don't then um, develop cancer in a different area. You would then maybe have um, potentially further treatment, hormone therapies um, or continued treatment, depending on your actual diagnosis and prognosis. So that's kind of the typical oncology pathway and identifying hopefully where radiotherapy may fall within there. So just to take you back a little bit, we all love a bit of history. So going back to a bit before our time, but 1895 uh, on the top left, was um, Wilhelm Rottingham who discovered x-rays in the German laboratory um, and actually that's where the first x-rays were done so that's his wife's hand as you can see the ring on the left um, the ring finger he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics uh, in 1901 but then one step further was also Marie Curie um, who took some of this research on and actually in World War One on the front line x-rayed soldiers um, in a little bus which was quite I think it's quite impressive to be honest and she also went on to win uh, two Nobel Prizes I think the top middle is a black and white photo of one of the first linear accelerators uh, in 1953. So we call them a linear accelerator, or you might also hear it called LINAC. Um, and then in the early kind of 1990s, when we had CT scanners, things started to develop a bit further. So in the bottom left um, just shows a treatment plan, um, which Joe's gonna go into in a bit more detail later. And then slowly uh, in the middle with the yellow kind of illumination, those are lead, kind of fingers size leaves if you want so we call them multi-leaf collimators so if you've ever had radiotherapy or if you're due to have it sometimes when you look sorry am i back I can hear the dog outside the door, so I think she's pulling the wire. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so in the middle, sorry, the multi-leaf collimators, um, so they effectively define the treatment edges. So no tumour is going to be the same size, and we can manipulate the, the radiation beam, which we'll come on to in a bit, um, just to shape the tumour. So radiotherapy through the ages, I think one of the amazing things about radiotherapy is the fact that because it is involving the use of AI, the technology, the software, it's developing at such a fast pace that actually we're able to treat patients who ordinarily would have been treated just primarily using surgical intervention. So for an example, lung patients now are receiving a, a very specialized type of radiotherapy um, over actually having surgery. And I think, you know, the more that the technology advances, the more that actually we're gonna be able to treat patients and cure them using radiotherapy rather than potentially toxic chemotherapy or, or, um, or surgical intervention. So some of the equipment on here looks quite space age, but this is currently in use. So um, on the left hand side there, we have an MRI LINAC. So MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. So some of you may or may be having um, an MRI scan. It uses really powerful magnets to essentially get really good soft tissue differentiation. And that sounds a bit fancy, but actually all we're doing is being able to look inside the body at really detailed images to see where potentially the tumor is or where it was is if they've had surgery or chemotherapy and then potentially where there's inflammation or fluid or air. So getting that differentiation allows us to be much more specific about where we're targeting our radiotherapy. Sometimes radiation can sound scary, um, but actually I think when we are targeting it and we're using it very precisely, then we're able to be able to damage those cancer cells without uh, permanently damaging the normal healthy cells. So the machine in the middle there, um, with my lovely colleagues um, that I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, this is a proton therapy unit here. And so proton beam therapy is quite a new technique um, within the actual UK. It's been used a lot abroad, um, but in the UK, we now have two NHS 
um, proton therapy machines that are being used. And essentially, the reason that the proton therapy is being used much more prolifically, and um, especially with pediatric children, is the way that the particles interact um, with the actual cells. And what typically will happen is a, um, a peak Bragg effect that ensures that the radiation will go through the skin surface, through the tissue, hit the tumour, and then the dose will drop off rapidly. So ordinarily with x-rays, you have x-rays traveling straight through the body and damaging anything that it comes into contact with. Whereas with proton therapy, the way that the particles actually work is they'll go through and get attenuated. So they'll be absorbed, their energy will be absorbed by some of those cells, hit the tumor, deposit 100% of their dose, and then it will fall off. So you won't get what we call exit dose. So um, proton therapy is being used much more um, for pediatric cancers. And there are also some research um, projects going on at the moment looking specifically at breast cancer proton treatments. We then have the cyber knife. So um, I've never seen the UK cyber knife machines, but I did have the pleasure to go to Hong Kong um, and it was pretty space age. So it essentially is a linear accelerator on a robotic arm. Um, and it does, it, it works like a space age machine and it can actually track the tumor. So um, the cyber knife is commonly used for very specific types of tumor that would ordinarily be very difficult to treat. So for anyone who maybe followed Bow Babe through her um, secondary cancer journey, she had quite a lot of cyber knife treatment, um, specifically to the lung and also to the liver. So any organs that have a tendency to move quite a lot benefit from cyber knife. And then lastly, at the bottom, we have gamma knife. So gamma knife is um, using a radioactive source. And essentially, it's a type of neurological surgery intervention that's very, very targeted, very specific for any head um, or brain cancers or conditions. There are some other things that potentially um, they may use gamma knife for. Gamma knife can sometimes be referred to as a much more invasive treatment because you actually have um, an immobilization device actually screwed into the skull, which sounds slightly scary, but there's it's all under general anaesthetic. Um, and actually patients tend to tolerate it really well, um, but they can be very long treatments, um, but very good for um, secondary brain metastases. And often patients will go for gamma knife rather than what we would class as external beam radiotherapy. So radiation is used for cancer treatments. Um, you know, we call it ionizing radiation because it forms, sorry, I'm getting a bit of echo. Um, because it forms electrically charged particles called ions um, in the cells as the tissue it passes through. So this can kill cancer cells, but also can affect their, the genes of the cells to stop them growing. Um, so there's other forms of radiation as well. So radio waves, microwaves, uh, and visible light as well, but they're called non-ionizing. So they, they don't have as much energy uh, as an ionizing radiation source. Um, and usually we put them into two major types of radiotherapy. So either you have photon radiation, particle radiation. Uh, so photon is generally x-rays and gamma rays. Particle will be electrons and um, protons, so like the machine that Joe just talked about, um, neutrons, alpha and beta particles, and also carbon ions. So some of these kind of ionization radiotherapy types, they all have different energies or more energies than each other. So it depends which one we would use for certain types of cancers. So the more penetration we need within a, you know, in someone's body. Um, and obviously we can also do superficial treatments too. So it's usually a clinical oncologist or sometimes a consultant therapeutic radiographer who are specially trained to consent and plan and design treatments. Um, and they'll use different types of radiation which are suitable for different cancers. Um, so usually a high energy photon beam is by far the best or the most common form of radiation that's used for cancer treatments. And it's the same type that you would have for an X-ray machine, just at a lower energy. So for example, if you went for a chest X-ray, so photon beam energies can affect cells along their path. So they go through the body to get to the cancer, exactly as we said. So as it goes through, um, there can be a bit of exit dose. So what we call is when the radiation goes into the body, they can exit out the other side. So we make sure that we limit the damage to any of the normal cells, which we'll come on to in a bit. Um, if you ever had radiotherapy or if you're going to go and have it, um, you'll be treated by a therapeutic radiographer or across the world, they're also called radiation therapists. So we're the only profession that are legally 
um, allowed to deliver radiation to treat patients. Okay, so how does it work? Well, essentially you have here a linear accelerator machine. So our patient is lying here on the couch. This is classed as the head of the gantry. So essentially this is where the, um, the photons, the x-rays are produced, and then they exit from this very small window here. So what can happen is the machine can rotate a full 360 degrees around you. And we need that to be so purely because we want to conform our radiotherapy doses exactly to you and where we're wanting to treat. Um, Tumours are not square. Um, and actually quite often you will find that patients who are going through radiotherapy, they might have um, very different anatomy, personalised anatomy. So we need to avoid certain structures or areas. So this machine needs to be able to move around a patient, but also the couch may move. You may have different immobilisation devices to get you in different positions, purely so that we can get you in the best possible position to ensure that we are um, accurately treating your cancer. Now, we operate within about two millimetres of accuracy, which highlights quite a lot of the time why we need you to be comfortable and also still. So you'll often find the radiographers um, asking you to lay nice and still, breathe away normally. They might ask you specifically to kind of get into a certain position and, and hold yourself. But I think one of the big things to be aware of is trying to be relaxed and comfortable is really important and um, trying to hold yourself in a position can be really really difficult you'll also find as well on here that there's pieces of equipment that stick out and these are essentially imaging um add-ons that we have onto our equipment to allow us to visualize inside the body to direct our x-rays as, as accurately as we possibly can do now what happens exactly as Numan said is the x-rays will come out of this head of the machine here they will be very targeted they will be in the shape that we ideally want them to be in and then what we will do is they will move past through the body through all of the cells normal healthy tissues as well as obviously depositing um, from lots of different angles to where we want the most dose to to be at um, and that may mean that the machine's moving around you as it's delivering treatment, or it may deliver some treatment, move to another angle and then deliver it and move to another angle and deliver it. Um, so to be aware that the machine does come close, but it shouldn't touch you, or if it does um, touch you, it's intended and hopefully the therapeutic radiographers will let you know about that. So obviously we've explained radiotherapy can use to cure cancers. Um, to be honest, I think we are quite underutilized. We only receive about 5% of the cancer budget um, just to an effective, you know, despite, despite us being an effective treatment modality, there's quite a few good stats on the screen there. So, I mean, you know, half of all cancer patients will benefit from receiving radiotherapy. So we're an important modality. Um, just something that we wanted to highlight is that we do have the pleasure, as we said, working with Radiotherapy UK charity as well, um, and especially the Catch Up With, Catch Up With Cancer campaign. Um, so working with MPs such as Graham Morris, um, Tim Farron, just to raise awareness of radiotherapy as a treatment modality. Um, but you can also get involved. Um, you can write to your MP to demand better funding or join our campaign. Um, I think it's quite important, especially with everything going on, the Catch Up For Cancer campaign. Um, next slide, please, Joe. So, we often refer to radiotherapy, but actually there are lots of different radiation treatment modalities available. So when we use a linear accelerator, as we've talked about and shown you a little bit, that's often referred to ex external beam radiotherapy. And if you're wanting to do some additional research on your own, that's something that you may also want to um, type in to look at. Um, although we never suggest just Googling um, as a caveat. <laughs> Um, you may also then have um, a type of treatment called brachytherapy. Now that can come in a variety of different ways. And again, dependent on where your tumour is, you may be eligible for brachytherapy. So typically when a tumour is within a cavity, 
that we can access. So for an example, a cervical um, cancer or a prostate cancer, then brachytherapy might be more beneficial. And that's essentially where we're using radioactive seeds or wires um, to be placed directly next to, a, to the tumor or where the tumor was if they've had surgery. So as you can see this image here, you've got this X-ray here and you can see these white um, what look like kind of rods and that's what we would refer to them as but essentially what's happening is those rods are very close to and actually enveloped around the tumor itself so that patient would go into theatre have those rods put in they would then be um, secured in place with lots of packaging and then they would be transferred to a, a lead lined room so it can be quite an isolated treatment and essentially the radioactive source would then be put into the rods to then deliver some radiation um, for a period of time that's been calculated using the dosimetry and how radioactive that source is. Um, and that hopefully delivers a much higher dose to where the tumor actually is or where it was. You may also um, come across radioisotope injections. So things like radium um, 233 or iodine 133, um, they are essentially designed purely to go all around the body um, and deliver Quite, quite an extensive dose, but to those cells that take that radioisotope up. So thyroid cancer is one that re responds really well to radioisotope injections. And then we have intraoperative. So intraoperative, as the name suggests, is when you are in theatre, um, your tumour is exposed, and then they use like a mini linear accelerator to deliver some radiation whilst you're in theatre and having your surgical um intervention um, and that can be done again for lots of different types of cancers um, but it's usually on those that are quite small um, and are more difficult to treat with say external beam radiotherapy or brachytherapy lots of these modalities are basically decided upon dependent on you as a person and um, your performance status so how well you are and how well you're able to cope with treatment um, but also in terms of where your cancer is and any organs, what we call organs at risk. So anything that potentially would be damaged irreversibly using radiation, we might want to choose a specific type of technique to minimize that damage as much as possible. So with radiotherapy, we would typically class our um, intent as either palliative radiotherapy or radical radiotherapy. Um, now, palliative radiotherapy, sometimes that name has has different connotations. I think if you say palliative, you think, oh, gosh, you know, that sounds quite scary. And actually, does that mean I, I'm going to die? Actually, it doesn't at all. Um, palliative or supportive care um, now, as the name suggests, is there purely to help and support you in managing any symptoms you may have. So if you have a tumor that is creating lots of bleeding or lots of pain, radiotherapy is really, really effective at being able to minimize that as much as possible. We usually use much less dose and we also usually use less fractions or the number of treatments that we deliver so that you're not having to come to and from hospital. Um, on lots of occasions. Then radical radiotherapy, the main aim is to cure and get rid of that cancer. And therefore we might use much higher doses, which might mean that you have a lot of um, increased side effects and you may be visiting the department much more frequently um, and therefore having, um, having to come and park and see us every single day, sometimes for up to eight weeks. Um, the images that I've put up here clearly show maybe the effects that radiotherapy can have. So this person here has a lung tumour. This is called a mesothelioma tumour. So this is essentially a tumour arising from the lining of the lung. And this patient was referred for radiotherapy, not aiming necessarily to cure them, um, but actually to just relieve some of the bleeding that they were experiencing um, and the breathlessness. So um, what they essentially did was they had five days worth of radiotherapy treatment, Monday to Friday. Treatment itself takes about 15 minutes, so nice and speedy. Um, and as you can see, six weeks later, when they've gone for another scan, you can see it's not got rid of the cancer, 
but it shrunk it to such an extent that they wouldn't be experiencing pain, they wouldn't be experiencing breathlessness so much, and they wouldn't be experiencing as much bleeding. So it's really designed to try and help and support patients, as well as obviously some patients um, with a name to cure. So one of the aspects of radiotherapy as well is the depth that we can treat to. Um, so on the bottom left, there's a photo of something called an electron applicator. So this is where this is attached to the head of the machine um, and it effectively brings the radiation slightly closer so it doesn't go as deep. So usually about five centimeters at the most. Um, so the handsome man on the right showcasing, we'd attach the, the applicator to the head of the machine. This type of treatment, it can get a little bit close to you, um, but we never let the machine touch you. We'd always talk you through what's going on. Generally, you'd see maybe skin cancers treated like this or sometimes boost um, to a tumor bed for a breast cancer patient, for example. So usually the electrons or the particle beams, um, they're produced by the linear accelerator, um, but they're guided by the electron applicators um, and they have a low energy, don't really penetrate that deep. Um, and yeah, nice and close to the surface. And it can also be used to trim uh, lymph nodes as well. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. So what happens when you come for rage therapy? Before we get you in for treatment, we have to make sure that your treatment plan and you are ready for the treatment. So this is a CT scanner. So it looks like a polo or a donut. Um, you might have this two or three weeks prior to your radiotherapy appointment. So it might come up as a planning scan, planning appointment, pre-treatment appointment. There's lots of different terminology for this one. Um, we'd have you come in. We'd explain everything prior to getting you in the room. So one of the therapeutic radiographers or even one of the students might explain this to you, tell you what position we need. Um, so this handsome man is putting something different on the bed to get you ready for this type of treatment. So everything varies per treatment site. Um, so it's very personalised. I know Joe's going to go into that in a bit more detail in a second, but usually this CT scan, whatever happens, we'll try and do it in one go. If you're claustrophobic, if there's any issues, there's lots of different things we can do to try and help. Um, and ultimately, this scan will formulate your treatment for the position itself. So we want you in the same position as for when you want you for the day. Um, I'll hand back to you, Joe. Thank you. I would say it can be quite daunting if you've never even heard of radiotherapy before, which is why Numan and I do so much work with RadChat, um, because it's maybe not the treatment that's talked about enough. But a lot of radiotherapy departments have some great resources on their websites. There are YouTube videos that kind of highlight what goes um, on during radiotherapy and the pre-treatment appointment so if you are in any doubt please do voice it to your clinical nurse specialist or phone your radiotherapy department and say you'd like more information about what's going to happen they would be more than happy to help and advise you one thing to be aware of in pre-treatment is for anyone who's had a diagnostic scan it is usually quite chilly so we do have to expose the area that we're treating, which again can be really intimidating. Um, but I just want to reassure you that we try as much as we possibly can to maintain your dignity. Um, we often will give you gowns or um, we will cover you up with sheets um, if we can do. Um, but it's just to be aware, some patients do find that they benefit from wearing some gloves or a woolly hat, unless we're treating those areas, obviously we'll have to get you to take those off. But um, by all means, it, whatever you feel is going to help you to lie nice and still and be comfortable. I think one of the most important aspects of pre-treatment is exactly as Numan said, because we're using this CT scan to plan your radiotherapy treatment, everything that happens during this pre-treatment, the position you're in, um, how you're breathing, those kinds of things, we're trying to replicate. So again, if you're kind of tensed, really nervous, um, you're really struggling with breathing, um, you're kind of cold, so you're shaking, um, or you're trying to be the best patient that you can possibly be, and you think, do you know what, I'm going to try and hold this position, I'm sure it'll be fine, when you come to treatment, and actually you find that every single day you have to hold that same really uncomfortable position for 15, 20 minutes, you won't be able to manage it. So it's much better to say to the therapeutic radiographers at this pre-treatment stage, that is not comfortable. I need to kind of position myself slightly differently. And um, here is your opportunity to get everything accurate. 
one thing I would say as well is quite often we will have music available in the rooms and um, quite a lot of the time now radiotherapy departments have nice visual displays um, for you to focus on and look at but by all means please do bring your own um, music if you wanted to. So one of the big things around pre-treatment is immobilisation. So as you can imagine, if I asked everyone to lie nice and still for 15, 20 minutes, you know, I would definitely itch. I would probably cough or rub my nose or do some twitching. Um, it's perfectly natural. So what we need to do is try and get you in a position where actually we're immobilizing the area that we, we're trying to aim our radiotherapy at. So as you can see in the top left hand corner, that is actually what we would class as a head shell. So for anyone having treatment to the head or neck area, we would use a mesh immobilization shell, which you can imagine is really daunting. Um, and actually quite a lot of our patients might need some relaxation support. If you are claustrophobic, you can ask to go for some complementary therapies before coming for radiotherapy, just to help prepare you as much as you possibly can do. You can still breathe absolutely normally um, and quite often you can actually see through the mesh as well. So it's, it's very personalised to you as to what you want to do. Um, but it is so important for us to make sure that you're comfortable and that you're able to maintain this position every single day. You'll see on the right hand side that this is a device um, called, that we call a breast board or a breast immobilization device. And that's typically the position that breast cancer patients will be in. Now, the reason for this is for actually um, taking the breast tissue off of the chest wall. And it's also removing um, the head of this bone here away from the actual treatment field. So often the radiotherapy treatment machine will deliver your radiotherapy from two specific angles so we need to make sure that anything that doesn't need to um, receive radiotherapy is put out of the way hence having your arms above your head now if you haven't gone for radiotherapy yet but you're due to and you've had surgery now is the time to start doing those physiotherapy exercises I've had lots of surgery and I definitely know that it's very easy to um, palm off the physios going, yes, I absolutely will do that prehab. Yes, I definitely will, I promise. And maybe kind of dabble with it. But actually for radiotherapy, um, especially for our breast cancer patients, it is really important for that shoulder mobilization. So doing those um, exercises is absolutely critical um, to make sure that you can get your arm above your head and slightly abducted as well. Um, and then we come onto this image down here. So you'll see you've got a nice comfy. We're not to we're not totally um, uh, making sure that you're not going to be able to maintain that position. Um, but you can see here we do have a little headrest and then we have what's called here a pro step which essentially allows you to put your feet in so that you don't slip down the bed and you feel supported and sometimes you might have something that we call a knee fix placed underneath the knees as well again to try and alleviate some of the pressure off your back now from these images you will very clearly see that there is no comfy mattress and that is why sometimes radiotherapy can be more difficult to maintain that position because it is as hard um, as a table. It's carbon fibre. And the reason for that is to allow the x-rays to be able to penetrate through the table without absorbing any of that energy that essentially we would prefer to be inside your body and deposited where we need the, the um, dose to be. So it is a very thin carbon fibre table. If we were treating from a specific angle or actually we weren't so worried about the accuracy of our dose, then actually you may have a very thin mattress placed on it um, on the table as well. So they're just some of the what we call immobilization devices that you may have to use as part of your treatment. So one of the aspects of radiotherapy and getting you ready at the pre-treatment appointment is we usually go for tattoos. So on the top left, you can see it's pointed. So we say it's the size of a freckle, less than a 5p coin. This is to help us obviously know the correct positioning for you. So we usually give you three. So for example, if you're doing your pelvis, you'll have one just below your belly button and then two on the left and then the right. Um, so they are small, they're semi-permanent dots. So semi-permanent tattoo ink. Um, they can fade with time. And actually on the bottom right, you can see the green sort of lasers that are projected onto the skin. It's not like anything from James Bond. It's not going to hurt you. We dim the room lights when we 
having the treat so when you're having the treatment itself the linear accelerator um in the room will dim the lights we'll put these lasers on which are calibrated with the machine you can see the numbers so we're quite fussy as joe said we work to millimeter accuracy so you need to make sure um you're there we effectively just go x marks the spot with these lasers on your left your right and then on the top um, and depending on where they are um and that's just how we can set you up in the room and we know the measurements as well um from the ct scan data uh, next slide please joe if tattoos don't fall in line with your culture or your religion, or you just prefer not to have them, um, obviously we'd highly recommend that you speak to the consultant oncologist um, when you're being consented to let them know your preferences, because you're entitled to the preferences. It doesn't mean you have to do as we tell you all the time. So there is this uh, method, which is called surface guided radiotherapy, um, which is effectively tattooless. So there are no tattoos that are needed. What it uses is quite fancy infrared cameras to measure for example for this patient on the bed their chest and it will visualize you and then it can move up and down help their radiographer set you up in the room um to not needing any tattoos unfortunately as i mentioned obviously with the funding side of things earlier not every department in the country has this but you can be referred to a center or asked to be referred to a center that does offer it that might involve a bit more travel but it's obviously it's your treatment and we want to make sure we give you the best possible um treatment for your cancer uh, next slide please joe Okay, so once you've been for pre-treatment and you've had that CT scan, then what will happen is that um, CT image will then go to our radiotherapy planning team. So we have an amazing team of physicists, dosimetrists, therapeutic radiographers um, working within radiotherapy planning. And essentially what they're going to do is they're going to contour round exactly where we would like to deliver 100% of our dose. They will also be um, ensuring that any organs at risk or organs that potentially could be damaged as a consequence of uh, receiving a radiotherapy dose are highlighted and that allows us then to make an executive decision on have we got the right technique have we got the right radiotherapy plan and as you can see here from this beautiful image you can see that the red is almost highlighting where 100 percent of our dose is and that's where we are wanting to target um, all of our radiotherapy and then as you can see the color wash goes to blue and the blue is showing that there is still some dose but actually it's more minimal and so what we would do is just review the anatomy to see whether or not we're happy with that and also look at what we call a dose volume histogram to essentially decide whether or not the dose being received by our organs at risk are within our limitations from doing the radiotherapy plan, we can quite accurately think about some of the side effects that patients may experience. So when you are there ready for treatment, you usually would have a pre-treatment talk. Um, you know, please do ask to see your radiotherapy treatment plan and have it explained to you because it can really help you from a long term perspective thinking about what areas of your body have actually received a radiotherapy dose um, and particularly you know 10 20 years later potentially you could have consequences of treatment as a result of the radiotherapy and kind of having an idea of where you receive that dose is really important so please do advocate for yourself and ask to see that radiotherapy plan and have it explained to you as to where's where's receiving dose so what I'm going to show you now is a little video. So I'm just going to see if this works this way. And so this video here, can I just check that is has shared properly? Thank you. Yeah. So this video here was created um, by the Northern Ireland Cancer Centre, who've done some work with us. Um, and I'll just play it and stop it as appropriate just to explain what the procedure is. So essentially, you can see these two lovely people, one of them, a therapeutic radiographer and a patient walking down what we call a radiotherapy treatment maze. Now, it sounds really bizarre that we've got a treatment maze, but that's essentially to stop the x-rays from leaving the room. Radiotherapy can sound really scary, but I promise you, your dose is very targeted. And as a therapeutic radiographer, we actually receive less dose than an airline pilot. 
So the design of the rooms is there purposefully to ensure that no radiation escapes the room. Radiotherapy is radiation that goes through the body. You don't store it. So it's not like having um, a radioisotope within your body. Um, you can leave your radiotherapy, be around children, cuddle your loved ones. Um, you aren't radioactive in any way having radiotherapy. So they are entering the room there and they would have very speedily popped you on the table on the radiotherapy couch, as I said. Not the most comfortable, but we've tried to make this patient as comfortable as possible by putting a nice sponge underneath the legs um, and head in on a nice comfortable sponge. So the two therapeutic radiographers here, you'll see are holding a pendant. So we stand either side of you whilst you're receiving your radiotherapy treatment. And actually it can be quite intimidating because as, you're, um, as you go up closer to the machine, you'll find that you're more or less at our head height and we will be communicating with each other to try and ensure the accurate setup. Essentially, before we start to even think about starting the treatment, we're wanting to get you in exactly the same position as you were when you went for your CT scan and planning for your radiotherapy. So you can see that the room lights are slightly dimmed and again it's radiographer preference as to how dim those lights are so if you're scared of the dark please do let the radiographers know they don't have to always work totally in the dark um, but we will dim the room lights so that we can see these laser lights and that will essentially allow us to set up according to those tattoos if you have them or potentially using our surface guided radiotherapy um, um, select equipment so as you can see, we're communicating from both sides to set you up using those laser lights and we do touch you. So what we have to do is actually mobilize you to get you in exactly the same position. Now, speaking from experience, you know, as therapeutic radiographers, we often um, simulate what a patient has to go through as part of our radiotherapy training. And it is very easy to think, oh, I'll, I'm being moved, I'll help them and I'll lift my bottom up a little bit and I'll roll, roll over or I'll, I'll move my arm a little bit. But I promise you, we are literally moving you millimetres. So please just lie nice and still, try and keep as comfortable as you can, breathe away normally. We are trying to move your body tiny, tiny amounts at this stage. You will find that we talk over you quite a lot. So sometimes it can be confusing because you think, oh, are they talking to me? But again, the therapeutic radiographers should be quite clear about if they are talking with you. The machine does come very close to you and it can feel um, close, but it shouldn't necessarily touch you and especially not at this stage. So you will be reassured the whole way through, but you will hear us reading out lots of figures, lots of numbers. Uh, we might be using very specialist language um, over and above you. And then as you can see here, the machine is actually rotating around. So we're actually positioning the machine according to where we want to start the treatment. And as you can see, it does come very close, but it's not gonna touch you. You can't really hear anything. It's just like a whirring as the machine goes round. Unless it's quite an old machine, then it can clunk a little bit. Um, please be reassured all the equipment works and it is checked daily to ensure the accuracy um, and safety of the equipment. Now, at this stage here, you'll see the machine is in the position ready to start. But the therapeutic radiographers leaving will check and make sure that you're in the right position, make sure everything's accurate and might read out some figures before leaving. They'll then probably shout over to you to say that they're leaving the room. At that point, please don't sit up and say, what did you say? Try and ignore us, uh, breathe away normally and then um, just stay in that position for as long as you can do until we tell you that the treatment's finished and you can get off the bed. So as the therapeutic radiographers leave the treatment room, you may find that the room lights go on and off. By all means, feel free to bring music if you want to. You'll also find that there's um, a button somewhere along the corridor or potentially on the outside called the last man out button. And that's essentially gonna create a bit of a buzzing noise. Now that buzzing noise is essentially a radiation safety mechanism to make sure that no one is left, left in the radiotherapy treatment room. So again, it's perfectly normal, but it's, it's something to kind of be aware of. And then once that has been 
press, the door is closed or potentially the gate, depending on the type of radiotherapy department you have. And then as you can see here, we're maybe controlling the machine from outside of the room, but at the same time talking to you should you need it through the intercom. But we're watching you all the time. So I'm just going to move back. So just making sure you can all see that again. Thank you. Okay, so. So there's quite a few different acronyms in healthcare um, and just wanted to touch on a few of them. Um, so you've got IMRT, Intensity Modulator Radiotherapy, there's also Image Guided Radiotherapy, Volumet uh, can't even say them, Volumetric Modulator Dark Therapy, Stereotactic Ablative Radiotherapy, Deep Inspiration Breath Hold. I promise when you, if you have treatment you don't need to remember any of these things, it's just how obviously we deliver the treatment. So the first one, IMRT, is one of the more modern techniques in the past sort of 15, 20 years. So that's where we're using those multi-leaf collimators. So as Joe just showed in the head of the machine and the lead lined kind of leaves to design and modulate the radiotherapy beam. Uh, image guided is the kind of the aspects of the machine that Joe pointed out that takes an onboard CT image. So it's not a diagnostic level scan, but it helps us visualize the field. So for example, if we're treating the pelvic area, we can look at your bladder, your rectum, and any other internal organs that we need to and make sure that the image guides the radiotherapy sometimes a zero millimeter accuracy and we can maneuver the bed outside of the room and um, so vmap has the machine moved around in that video that's exactly what it is so the arc is what what it's trying to say that the machine will move around 360 degrees again there's no tumor is exactly symmetrical or the same all the way around again the head of the machine and it will also move in different directions kind of in 360 that's the shower head kind of element of the machine as the machine also moves 360 degrees around you so lots, it's a lot more precise. Um, not every treatment is able to be delivered this way, um, but majority of the treatments are now. And then Sabre is a very high dose of radiation. Um, again, quite a, a small category of patients are able to have this because it depends on your performance status, as Joe said earlier, how well you are. Um, but as we move forward, this treatment is being offered more and more. Uh, and the last one is breath hold. So we normally do between 15 to 20 seconds, and it's usually for patients with left-sided chest or breast cancer and that's just to help them by holding their breath in if you try it yourself now if you want to i won't time you though so make sure you stop after a few seconds um just takes your chest wall away from the heart so it limits any dose possible um to the heart especially on the left hand side and with that the the radiotherapy dissymmetry team that joe spoke about earlier they will work even harder to make sure that for example if you're not able to hold your breath for too long we can still shield the heart completely um, Joe, do you want to go on to the next? I think yeah, it might be worth just time. noting if anyone was um, to have to have a technique called deep inspiration breath hold, um, there's an amazing resource called Respire. If you just Google Respire radiotherapy breath hold, um, it should come up. Um, but it's a great resource that's been developed to help support patients who are going to go and have um, radiotherapy with DIBH. So we're going to skip the case studies because we've talked too long already. I do apologise. Um, so skin reaction is a, a normal aspect of radiotherapy. Not every treatment site will have um, a skin reaction, but over 95% of radiotherapy patients will have some form of skin change. And that could be that the skin feels slightly rougher or a bit drier, or it could be um, that it presents into a different type of skin reaction. So for lighter skin tones, you'll normally see that the skin will start to go a bit pinker or a bit redder. Um, and then eventually it might look more like a tan post-treatment but um, for people with really dark skin so if they're more pigmented it'll actually look darker it could also go purple yellow or gray so different kind of color spectrum elements uh, and then eventually um, it will even look it will look even darker than it has done before um, so this on the bottom left is just an information for patients which we can link with this afterwards but it's also found on the society of radiographers website so it's their patient skin reaction leaflet so it just highlights what happens how you can look after your skin um, and kind of what stages to look out for as well. On the top right is just an example of the perfect kind of square shape of where we treated someone's spine. Um, again, this is obviously a lighter skin tone, so that's what to expect with the color changes. This will normally present like this, maybe 
either straight after the first few treatments, if it's a high dose or within a week or two post radiotherapy, but it can continue sometimes for up to six weeks afterwards. Um, usually we now say that any kind of moisturizing cream is okay, as long as it doesn't have metals or any perfumes in, but this uh, skincare leaflet highlights again, what's really important for your skin and how to look after and maintain that integrity of the skin barrier. Thanks, Thanks Jay. Okay, so radiotherapy does cause side effects. Um, radiotherapy is often referred to as the easy treatment and as therapeutic radiographers, we know that that isn't the case for everyone. So please don't be swayed by thinking this is gonna be the easy one. I've sailed through chemotherapy, I've got nothing to worry about. It's kind of preparing yourself really. Um, and then if you don't have any, then it's perfect. Um, I think the best thing to be aware of is that depending on where you're having treatment, any cells um, that are normal are going to respond to the radiotherapy. So if, for example, you were having radiotherapy to the prostate area, your bladder and rectum will be affected. If you're having um, treatment to the breast or chest wall area, the lung, potentially a little bit of the throat, um, the armpit may be affected. Um, so it is very personalised and dependent on where the x-rays are actually travelling through and the dose and how many treatments you're actually having. So side effects will um, be part of the consent form that you sign, but also you will be able to talk to the therapeutic radiographers throughout your treatment about the side effects and get the support that you need. Um, there are also some amazing webinars on the Move More um, website that our lovely colleague Emma Hallam did um, talking about late effects of radiotherapy. So again, please do check those out. So hopefully lasting impressions. Um, we've kind of gone through how radiotherapy works, that it's not always the easiest of treatments, but there's lots of support and advice available to you. So please do seek that out. Ask your therapeutic radiographer questions. As Rad Chat, we get so many questions over Instagram. And uh, one of the first things we say is, have you spoken to your therapeutic radiographers? And patients always go, oh, I don't want to bother them. Absolutely bother them. That's what they're getting paid for. So ask all the questions, anything, however simple it seems, ask it. And they really love having to explain the physics questions. So definitely ask how the linear accelerator works. They love that one. Um, and also just to be aware that you can have consequences of treatment for life from, uh, from radiotherapy. Unfortunately, it is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, quite often we will have patients who sail through treatment, have no side effects at the time of receiving radiotherapy, and then some 10, 20 years later start to experience um, side effects. That is something that can happen. And unfortunately, what often happens is you'll present to your GP with one of those side effects um, and the GP will think it's something else and send you on a big diagnostic pathway to find out what it is. Please rest assured that actually, um, you know, if you know that that could be a consequence of treatment, bear it in mind. Let your healthcare practitioners know that you've had radiotherapy and could it be a consequence of treatment? And just to be aware that all radiotherapy and everything that we've stated today is very personalized. Um, and we've given some examples, but just to be aware that if you do want individualized, personalized care and support to speak to your healthcare team or have a look at Rad Chat and go through maybe some of the resources um, that are very personalized to a specific cancer. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and we've got some time for questions, I think. Yes. Can he, can everyone hear me now? Hopefully. We can. Yeah. Bro, Joe and Naaman, thank you so much. That was, I learned so much. That was amazing. Um, I did not know any of that about radiotherapy at all. So thank you for sharing. And hopefully everyone else has learned a lot too. We did have some questions in the chat box. Can you both see those, whoever I want? To direct one of them too so i'll read it out for anyone listening to the recording um someone said i had two doses of chemo to augment my radiotherapy head and neck cancer um, hopefully that's correct how does that work please don't know so, which yeah. one of you wants to take it yeah go for it jay thanks um essentially some patients will have chemotherapy which will radio sensitize the cells so it's essentially a way that will um highlight for us in radiotherapy that 
these cells are really active and they're going to be more responsive to the radiation treatment. Um, sometimes you can have concurrent, um, which means it's at the same time or adjuvant where you've had it previously or afterwards. Um, so chemotherapy, especially for some of the head and neck cancer, works really well when we have radiosensitized cells so that we know that they're going to be active um, during that radiation treatment. Numan, I don't know if you'd want to add anything else. No, I think explained it perfectly. <laughs> that, oh, I think you've got a thumbs up. So thanks very much for that. Perfect. Um, so the other question was, um, are there any standard exercises they give you after breast surgery? Yes, they are. Um, you can usually find a good printout of them from on Breast Cancer Now. I think their charity website, they get a big printed one. Um, usually those. Uh, for each kind of treatment site, there's different things you can do. Obviously, the I think, Joe, you might actually be better to answer this one because of your prehab background, but um, some of the elements of doing the exercises, it's not just the exercises, it's everything else. We're trying to keep active and a healthy lifestyle as well. But Joe, you're prehab queen, so I'll hand over. <laughs> I would direct you, because of the time frame, I would direct you to the Rad Chat Instagram page. And we have some amazing videos, actually, um, specifically for breast cancer patients um, or anyone having chest radiotherapy, where um, we have an amazing physio called Kat, who basically demonstrates um, lots of different exercises that you should be doing. Brilliant. We can link them as well, can't we, Georgie? Yeah, I was just going to say we'll send the presentation and some links at the end, but we can stop the recording now in case anyone um, asked, 